You're listening to Forensic Talk with Jim Campbell, 1490 WTCA, Greenwich. Russia's road from perestroika and glasnost to Yeltsin and Putin's corruption, terror, and dictatorship. We go inside the criminal state of Russia with the first American journalist to be expelled from Russia. David Satter has written about Russia for almost four decades now. He's a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute and a fellow of the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, known as Zeiss. His new book, The Less You Know, The Better You Sleep, Russia's Road to Terror and Dictatorship under Yeltsin and Putin. Welcoming you uh, from Paris this morning. David, how are you? Oh, fine. Glad to be with you. It's a good afternoon over there. Um, just a first It's co- afternoon here, definitely. Yeah. Uh, just a quick question uh, first. Um, in, in response to these sanctions that were just voted by Congress, there uh, Putin's already uh, apparently had uh, some of our property seized, and we're going to have diplomats chucked out of there. Any comment on that? Well, it's an appropriate measure, and uh, uh, Putin's reaction is, uh, you know, he can do it. He can he can take whatever steps he likes, but the but the fact is that the aggression against a sovereign state, the seizure of territory, uh, has to be. Uh, answered, and uh, the Russians have to understand that they'll pay a price for that. So uh, they have not, they continue to be waging war in Ukraine. They, they have not released or they've not returned Chechnya to, uh, not Chechnya, Crimea, I'm sorry, uh, to, uh, to Ukraine. So uh, I think that further sanctions are in order. All right. Uh, talking about uh, having diplomats thrown out, how did you get yourself thrown out of Russia? Well, I can say that I didn't do much. <laughs> uh, the, I had been in Moscow only for three months uh, on assignment as uh, an accredited correspondent, but also an advisor to the Russian Service of Radio Liberty. And during those three months, I had time to open a bank account, to go through a lot of bureaucracy, uh, to do some shopping. I did a few articles, but you know, for the most part, they concerned historical events. So uh, I think it was in anticipation of what I would do. Uh, And uh, the Russian authorities had been tolerating me for an awfully long time. Uh, I had written about the 1999 apartment bombings, which brought uh, Putin to power. And that's the most important question in in Russia's post-Soviet history. I mean, the fact that most Americans are unaware of it doesn't make it less important. It just shows the extent to which uh, we have not fulfilled our kind of intellectual responsibilities. But uh, the situation changed in the world. There was a revolt in uh, neighboring Ukraine in which uh, the people of Ukraine united, in effect, to throw out a kleptocratic ruler. The Russian authorities saw that as a very undesirable precedent, and the previous liberal liberal attitude that they had applied to foreign correspondents uh, seemed to be a luxury they could no longer afford, and the first person that they wanted out of there was me. Um, we've, you know, we've spoken with Bill Browder before, we're speaking with him again, and he's uh, definitely felt that he's at risk and has had to do uh, measures to protect himself. Did you ever feel at uh, safety risk? Well, in Russia, no, uh, but that may well have been a miscalculation on my part. I was counting on the fact that any action taken against me would only give credibility to the things I was saying. And they they seemed to have adopted an attitude early on that they were going to treat accusations that the government itself carried out those bombings as just some sort of fringe conspiracy theory. And the best way to do that was not to not not to do anything violent in in relation to me. Uh, But, of course, given the sensitivity of the topic, uh, a different reaction might have been possible on their part. I mean, I was just my knowledge of them, the, the Russian psychology, the Putin regime led me to believe that they would not take any kind of violent action against me. And in fact, they didn't while I was in the country. It, it came to just uh, de- a decision to expel me. 
uh, how they are likely to react in the future uh, is unpredictable, I think, because uh, they're handicapped by the fact that I'm outside the country. Of course, they do carry out uh, uh, kind of uh, acts of <laughs> acts of violence, for, better, for, for want of a better way to put it, against people who are outside the country. But it's much more complicated. And uh, my guess is that uh, at this point in historical time, they're not going to want to give the things I'm saying greater credibility by taking some kind of direct action against me. Let's hope I'm right. This uh, Trump-Putin bromance that occurred during the election, um, do you have any uh, uh, guess what that's based on, Uh, collusion, uh, end the sanctions, deal, any of that stuff? No, I think that's all a lot of nonsense. I I think that Hmm. what it's based on is just vintage American dilettantism and stupidity. Uh, (laughs) Every American uh, presidential candidate since Reagan, practically, Reagan was the great exception, also the most effective president in dealing with Russia, uh, has gone into office or has waged waged his campaign uh, with the idea that because of the charm of his personality, he can bring the Russians around and we can have a, a working relationship. Uh, it's, it's always the same. Uh, a president comes into office blaming the, the problems in U.S.-Russian relations on his predecessor, as Obama did in the case of George Bush. Uh, and then over time, he begins to understand that the problems are really the result of, of Russia's own actions. Uh, but that takes usually four to eight years before the reality sinks in. At that point, a new president comes in, announces a reset, and the process just starts all over again. Well, in the case of Trump, you know, he he saw that there were bad relations between the U.S. and Russia. He didn't have any background. He was just a businessman. Uh, and uh, so he, he began... Uh, enunciating some really naive and superficial and actually very harmful positions. Hmm. And he chose as advisors persons who should have not been anywhere near uh, the, the center of power, because one of them was, a, was somebody who had done business with Gazprom, one of the, probably the, the most corrupt <laughs> corporation in the world, and, a, and, a, and a, an entity that that spreads its tentacles of corruption to everyone uh, who has anything to do with it. But uh, since he's become president, uh, Trump partially because he's he's now in a position where he has to listen to it to qualified advisors and he has access to intelligence information, has moderated a lot of the really ridiculous things he said. And I hope that that process will 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 continue as for the idea that there was collusion or anything like that that's just nonsense i know the whole country is going crazy over it but the fact is the russian intelligence just doesn't work that way uh and a uh a russian intelligence operation designed to change the outcome of an election would have been planned years in advance it would have involved meticulous preparation and timing and it would also have been conducted in secrecy. It would have been accompanied by something that's called uh, a cover operation, uh, or in Russian it's called operatsia prikritia, in order to make sure that the, you know, that the core intelligence operation would never be discovered. Now, we recently had uh, a lot of discussion about the meeting between uh, Donald Trump Jr. and a, and a lawyer who had alleged connections to the Russian government. Uh, and this is supposed to, so that the, the Russian government, according to this version, is uh, handling uh, a move to dictate the or to influence the election of the American president by email through a music promoter in London. Hmm. Uh, I understand that people in the U.S. believe this, but no one who actually had real knowledge 
would take such a thing seriously. Um, before we get into some of these just uh, amazing uh, instances of killing their own people um, uh, under cover that it was, uh, say, Chechen rebels, etc., you say one of the things that we have to understand over here, which is hard to understand, is that we have to learn to believe the unbelievable and the degradation of, of, human, of humans there. What do you mean by that exactly? Well, uh, we are inherit <clears throat> the inheritors of the Western religious and philosophical tradition, uh, which establishes the, the ultimate worth of the individual, uh, and in particular argues that the individual is an end in himself. Uh, in Russia, the individual is raw material for the realization of whatever crazy idea come, comes into the heads of whoever it is is holding power. Uh, and once uh, we get that straight, a lot of things that are confusing or were confusing become clear. Uh, but the Russians do everything possible to convince us that they're really just like us and to induce us to react to them as we would react uh, to our fellow Americans. And uh, that allows them to mislead us time and time again. All right. Um, we're going to get into this road to, to Putin. And, um, and again, uh, you mentioned this earlier, we have very little understanding of these events. Start with the 1999 apartment bombings. Well, there were four buildings that were blown up in the middle of the night and killing hundreds of people, uh, including entire families were wiped out. In some cases, the remains of, were, of, of, of those people were never found. The, the explosion was so devastating. And uh, the, the bombings were used to justify the Second Chechen War, a new invasion of Chechnya which was carried out with barbaric methods, but it boosted the popularity of the previously unknown head of the Federal Security Service, the FSB, Vladimir Putin, and resulted in him being elected president. Now, uh, a fifth bomb was discovered in the basement of a building in Ryazan, a city uh, southeast of Moscow, and it was... Uh, uh, deactivated and tested, and it was tested positive for hexagon, which is the explosive that was used in the previous bombings. And uh, a search began in the city for the persons who put the bomb in the basement, and they were caught. But they turned out to be not Chechen terrorists. They turned out to be agents of the FSB. And uh, under this, now the FSB then announced that this was a training exercise. A Purely absurd explanation for what had happened, but it was enough to silence people both inside Russia and in the U.S., by the way, because I received documents from the State Department that, which made clear that the U.S. government was thoroughly informed about what was happening, but chose to, to remain silent. And uh, as a result of it, we helped facilitate the conditions under which Putin became dictator for life and all the problems that we have now. The hostage uh, seizing at a theater uh, on Drubovka, if I pronounce that right, that was in 2002. Dubrovka, Dubrovka. Dubrovka. Tell us about that one. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, 2002, the Second Chechen War was beginning to take a very heavy toll, and uh, many people in Russia were... Uh, losing their enthusiasm for this war. And uh, public opinion polls showed that uh, many, many persons, in fact, a majority, favored a negotiated settlement. Uh, suddenly, Chechen terrorists, an army of Chechen terrorists, who had assembled in the center of Moscow, seize a theater and take a thousand persons hostage. Well, how is it possible in the middle of a war for... 40 heavily armed uh, terrorists uh, riding around in armored cars that are, that are in fact, uh, controlled by, by the FSB. That's the Federal Security Service. How is it possible for them 
to take control of the theater. And then uh, the government refused to negotiate, flooded the, the theater with, with lethal gas, killing hundreds of hostages, of course, and then uh, shooting all of the terrorists. The better, you know, the better to assure that they wouldn't reveal any inconvenient details about their collaboration with the security services. But the result was exactly what the authorities probably wanted. Uh, all taught, you know, the world was horrified by the bar- barbarity of the terrorists and paid relatively little attention to the details that suggested that the authorities were working with the man in hand in glove uh, and uh, overlooked the, the terrible civilian casualties and the refusal, refusal to negotiate and simply drew the conclusion that any negotiated settlement of the of the Chechen war was out of the question and in fact those efforts came to an end and uh, just to, just so people realize how profound this is in the, in the first example 1999 bombings what the russians essentially did was kill their own people to distract and increase the popularity ratings of uh, Putin, which were at 2% at the time, as, as you say. That's uh, pretty cynical. Now, the 2004, the Beslan School gym massacre. No, Beslan School, a massacre. I mean, the, the, the hostages were herded into the gymnasium. And uh, the, the rush is the, basically the same situation. Evidence of cooperation with the in facilitating the takeover. And then an attack on the terrorists, in this case, uh, with uh, heavy weaponry, including flamethrowers, and uh, uh, on a gymnasium where there were terrorists, but there were also hundreds of parents and children, uh, hundreds of of whom were burned alive, of course. Uh, And uh, the... the, uh, the lives of the hostages were written off uh, the minute uh, the school was seized. And David, and that was uh, obvious. David, the uh, related to this, Anna Polakovskaya was a journalist who was uh, very aggressive in investigating all this. Uh, all this, what happened to her coming out of this? Well, Anna Polakovskaya was murdered, and uh, the conditions uh, all demonstrate. Uh, that um, this was planned by the by the regime and carried out by the FSB. Uh, everything we know about that assassination, and uh, her fate was shared by others who tried to investigate the regime's involvement in terrorist acts. In the in the remaining four, uh, 40, 50 seconds, um, when these things happen, Putin always says we're going to find these killers. Bort. Boris Nemtsov, who was killed in the uh, right, almost in the Kremlin, um, do they ever uh, ever find these killers? Oh, they sometimes round up a bunch of people who they claim hmm. uh, carried the killing out. They never find the mastermind, and oftentimes the persons that they round up are just chosen at random. <laughs> they need they need to throw somebody in prison or, or to pretend they, that they're doing something. And this is Forensic Talk with Jim Campbell. We'll be right back with David Satter. Attention small business owners. Growing your business can be tough. Just when you thought you were making money, you found out that you owe the government money. And now that you owe the IRS their cut of your business profits, you may be broke. And if you don't take things seriously, you could go to jail or have your business shut down. But you do have an option. If the IRS is threatening you for unpaid taxes, call the Tax Resources Network. Their tax professionals and ex-IRS agents have over 23 years of experience dealing with the IRS, saving business owners and the self-employed millions in tax dollars. Let us negotiate with the IRS on your behalf. We may be able to reduce your tax debt for a lot less than you owe, help with the IRS audit, and even criminal investigations. If your business owes the IRS $15,000 or more and the IRS is threatening you, don't wait and let your business get shut down or worse. Call for a free consultation. Call 800-910-4980. 800-910-4980. That's 800-910-4980. Again, 800-910-4980.
We're talking with David Satter. He's an expert on Russia at the Johns Hopkins University School for Advanced International Studies. And um, the, the I, I guess let's go into uh, they moved to capitalism. And uh, you talk about how, you know, the prices are freed and 2,500% uh, uh, inflation eats everybody's savings. And then all these corrupt things are done from credits, bribes, vouchers. Um, talk about how, how, how did capitalism get so diverted into becoming a criminal state, essentially? Well, this is always possible when, when uh, capitalism is practiced without the benefit of the rule of law. Yeah. Uh, the law, law is what is necessary in order to regulate the competitive nature of capitalism. And this is something that was understood among others by, among others, Adam Smith, who said that uh, the market is equivalent to exchange. You know, I give something, and I, of course I don't get the same thing back, but I get it the equivalent thereof under prevailing conditions of supply and demand. But how do you guarantee equivalent exchange only with a framework of rules? And so the very nature of the market presupposes the existing the existence of some type of ethical and legal framework. Now, that's what was destroyed in communism. Uh, And uh, as a result, when the Soviet Union uh, disappeared and Russia emerged as an independent state, it didn't have the, 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 the necessary legal, moral, ethical basis uh, for establishing a market economy, and no steps whatever were taken to create it. The result was that the, the economy was transformed. It went from a, an economy of collective ownership, based on collective ownership, to an economy based on private ownership, and it was done in a very... A uh, compressed period of time, but the the final product was not democratic market based uh, capitalism, but rather uh, a, you know, uh, a, a, a criminal uh, a, a a banded capitalism run by a criminal oligarchy. Uh, I think at one point, uh, just 110 Putin cronies had about 35 percent of the of the GDP. Is it, is it around that level, how much he was able to concentrate? Yeah, that's by, those, those are the best estimates. That's what they control. Another amazing statistic, between 92 and 98, the GDP of Russia fell 50 percent. The life expectancy fell uh, six years. So in that sense, Putin looks good by turning stuff around but based on basic oil money, I would assume. Well, of course. I mean, the Russians, you know, people in the West who who idealize Yeltsin, including a lot of past and yeah. present government officials who bet on him, uh, they're uh, reluctant to face the fact that, that he inflicted uh, incredible hardship on the Russian people, and he was and he was hated for a re- he was hated and hated for a reason. Then, of course, oil prices began to surge. And in addition, uh, the basic institutions of a market's economy were created. And I mean, by this, I mean uh, uh, privately owned structures. Uh, obviously, it was a market without uh, it wasn't a true market insofar as uh, it was heavily monopolized, run by criminals and uh, without the basis of law. But nonetheless, nonetheless, capitalist structures were created. And so when uh, raw material prices, which uh, uh, had been depressed, began to boom, uh, the conditions were created for a a massive economic recovery. And uh, Putin was the beneficiary of that. And in business, uh, Putin would actually just strip folks of power, right? Uh, if they if if he if they wouldn't subjugate totally to him. And um, Kordovsky is an example. Yukos Oil was like the biggest company then, and he just put the guy in prison, right? Yeah, Kharkovsky. Yeah, he was he he, he had him arrested, and uh, uh, in fact, he had had and has the power to do that to anyone, which is one of the reasons why the oligarchs in, in Russia 
those who control big big money are completely subservient to the regime. Has Putin, uh, how much money do you think Putin has or stolen, and where is that money? Well, he's, he's by, by most accounts, he's stolen billions and billions, and it's in the West. Uh, what he plans to do with it is hard to say, but uh, the, the mentality that has gripped the people who are in charge in Russia, is uh, a mentality of literally uncontrolled gluttony. <laughs> uh, it is just, uh, they don't have, by their very nature, they don't have a conception of any reason for which wealth might be used. And so they fall into a cycle of endless, con- of endless in- accumulation. Nothing is enough. And uh, they've passed on these habits to their entourage, to their hangers-on, to all those who are connected with them. They buy everything. They buy uh, yachts, planes, villas. They buy women. Uh, it's, uh, but, but no matter how much they acquire, uh, they never have enough. I had a friend who sold private jets uh, or who was involved in the sale of private jets jets to Russian oligarchs. And, you know, in in the case when an American buys a private jet, an American corporate executive or successful businessman, he's very concerned about the technical specifications. When a Russian buys a private jet, he wants to make sure that it's just as expensive and gaudy as the jet that his friend bought. Its actual qualities don't interest him much. And that's the mentality that is that is that is driving those at the center of Russian power. Now, you do a great job of explaining how Putin basically eroded the separation of powers almost methodically. You call it vertical power. But obviously, in this country, we like to have an independent media, independent business, Congress and courts. Uh, Take us through how he basically cut through each one of those. Well, in fact, it wasn't Putin who who took the first step and maybe the most important step. It was Yeltsin, because in 1993, Yeltsin abolished the parliament. Uh, and that set, the, that set the, the, the pattern for everything that was going to happen afterward. By the way, our uninformed American officials fully supported the action of Yeltsin. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why we have these problems today. Uh, Yeltsin dispersed the, the, the parliament, and he did it violently. He did it with the help of provocations. And so the pattern was set very early, and it was set not by Putin. It was set by Yeltsin. Uh, the super presidency that was, that was created under Yeltsin basically stripped the legislative branch of government of it, uh, any ability to control the actions of the people in the executive. And from that point on, it was a question of bring, of, of controlling the press. Well, Putin's first project as president was to take control of the national television networks, which he did through a series of rather complex financial maneuvers in one case and in the other uh, by uh, arresting the leader of an independent television network and told him and telling him either to hand over the network or go to jail. Uh, Once national television was in the hands of the regime, uh, and the next step was to stamp out independent business. And that was undertaken with the arrest of Mikhail Khodorkovsky and uh, the sentence he received to a long term in a labor camp. He was accused of tax fraud and, no, avoiding taxes and fraud. Uh, The details of the charges against him were uh, even, well, I I would say this. The charges against him could have been brought against any Russian oligarch Hmm. who made money in the 1990s. So this was a case of selective prosecution. All those who uh, were subservient to Putin and made sure that their wealth was used uh, for the political purposes of the regime where necessary 
uh, were allowed to keep their wealth. Khodorkovsky, who had independent political ambitions, he was put in jail, and the message was conveyed to everyone else. So uh, the regime now controlled the parliament, the media. It had subordinated business, and under these conditions, there was really no room for an independent uh, legal system or an impartial uh, prosecutor or police. And uh, so one by one, the levers of power were, were simply taken over by the regime. Today, today there's no real opposition is possible within the, within the, the structure of government. I have to tell you, you know, uh, David, Putin really is kind of a brilliant job, isn't it, that he's, uh, he's done? And when you have, I guess, terror at your hands, it's it's pretty, uh, I guess, a facility. Well, you know, I don't know how brilliant it is. He's not that brilliant. I mean, but they're, they're cunning people who who work on this, and they're, they're, the, the, re, the real advantage is not so much that they're brilliant, but that they're dealing with people like us who are extremely unbrilliant. Let me ask you a que- uh, let me ask you about that. Why would when you see how corrupt these companies are and how they trade the uh, they give the you know they get the assets for almost nothing and then they're worth billion on the market? Why does their stock market have any credibility? Well, I mean that's the original what you're referring to is the the original circumstances under which they acquired yeah, uh, these properties they'd give it to the guy. Business. Yeah, the guy's brother would get a division for you know twenty million. That's worth a billion bucks. The I, I know in some cases Price Waterhouse would sign off on that, but then you know it just seems like the companies are completely corrupt and and financially uh, you know um, hard to uh, you know prove whether there's any um, you know truth there and how, how can they sell stock in these companies? And it's just I don't know. I don't. I don't. I don't quite get how. Uh, people um, have well, a lot. I mean, in the in the case of some of these companies, uh, they're raw, you know these are raw material yeah. uh, exporters, and in some cases, and they uh, uh, you know it's a minority in any society that is interested in ethical questions, mm-hmm. and especially when it comes to business. Uh, and uh, our Western businessmen see opportunities for profit, and that that's all they're looking at in many cases. Of course, in some cases, they don't want to invest simply because uh, they're afraid of getting into a situation in which there's no protection uh, of law. But if they feel that they can that they can make a profit, they oftentimes are stunningly uh, uncurious. Okay. about uh, the people with whom they're dealing. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, I'm going to ask you about you know what you see Russians fade as. And you look historically, they've always liked authoritarian leaders to begin with, czars who were fairly corrupt themselves. What do you see as their fate? And, and, and is Putin trying to restore some czarist Russia empire type of vision? Uh, I think, well, he talks about that, but I think that's really uh, just a cover. I think what the, what he's really interested in doing is making sure that he and his his cronies hold on to power. Uh, I think they're realistic enough to know that Russia, uh, which hangs on in the world on the basis of raw material exports, uh, is not in a position to restore the Tsarist Empire or the Soviet Union. Mm-hmm. Uh, they they would like to, they threaten that and and they will continue to do it because uh, it convinces a lot of people in the outside world that they have to deal with Russia. But uh, I, I think that the, the core objective of this regime is just to hold on to power in a situation in which they know that the days may well come and people will wake up to the realities of their thievery and their crimes. What will it take uh, for that to happen, and uh, it, it, for, is there a chance of a revolution? I think it's happening in a, in a way already. Uh, there's a lot of discontent, and the, the recent demonstrations and anti-corruption demonstrations in Russia, which focused on Dmitry Medvedev, the prime minister, but it actually uh, target the entire regime because Medvedev's behavior is typical. Um, 
they had they they mobilized a lot of young people and and they did it in cities all over the country. Uh, I think that tendency can only grow as it becomes clear that Putin has no intention ever to surrender power. The corruption gets worse and worse. The lawlessness gets worse and worse. And it's a stultifying environment that's created for people. And those who are the most creative, the most individual, the most uh, able to contribute to their country are the ones who are suffering the most. The, uh, I looked this up, and Russia's GDP, uh, at least a year or two ago, was about $2.1 trillion. Italy's was two point, almost 2.1, so they're almost the same. Why do we treat Russia as a superpower? Well, I mean, Russia has a formidable army, and it has nuclear weapons, and it has uh, the experience of subversion uh, of that was that it inherited from the from the Soviet Union. Uh, and of course, Russia is a huge country. So uh, and it has vast natural resources. Uh, under these circumstances, uh, the West is often obliged to deal with Russia, although we, we take it more seriously than it deserves. The, um, the, their, their economy is in bad shape right now. We, are, on the other hand, are heading towards uh, energy independence. Should we uh, you know, essentially do economic warfare on them? What sanctions would, would really hurt Russia? Well, probably banking sanctions, because they, like everybody else, are dependent on the U.S. banking system. Uh, the, the sanctions that have been imposed are, are reasonably effective, in, in, at least in conveying the message that uh, Russia can be made to suffer for its uh, aggressive behavior. May be necessary if the, if there's no progress in re- resolving some of the pressing issues do concerning they, Ukraine, do that those sanctions will be intensified. Thanks to David Satter. You've been listening to Forensic Talk with Jim Campbell. You can access our show on YouTube. Search Forensic Talk with Jim Campbell or Park City Productions 06604. Listening to Forensic Talk with Jim Campbell. Is Donald Trump mentally ill? Dangerously? We'll hear from leading mental health experts tonight on Forensic Talk with Jim Campbell. Dr. Bandy Lee is an assistant clinical professor in law and psychiatry at the Yale School of Medicine. She worked in several maximum security prisons, co founded Yale's Violence and Health Study Group, leads a violence prevention collaborators group for the World Health Organization. And she's one of the leaders of Duty to Warn, a group of mental health experts who banded together with Bandy to warn of the dangerous case of President Trump using their words. She's the editor of The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump, 27 Psychiatrists and Mental Health Experts Assess a President. We're also joined by one of those 27 experts himself, Tom Singer, psychiatrist and Jungian analyst. He's the He's a graduate also of the Yale Medical School. He's chair of the Extended Education Committee of the San Francisco Young Institute, author of Who's the Patient Here, among some of his other works. Welcome, Doctors Lee and Singer. Honored to have you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. And uh, as you say, we banded with Bandy, but this is pretty serious stuff. I want to start off, you know, from a big picture perspective, Bandy. Why is Trump uh, such a clear and present danger in your mind? Go ahead. Sure. Yes, in terms of uh, Mr. Trump, uh, we feel that even though we haven't evaluated him, we believe that we've seen enough to come to a consensus conclusion that he and the office of the presidency poses a danger to the nation and to the world. There are many reasons uh, for this. Usually when someone has a tendency for violence, they have a past history. There's a process that goes on before the end event uh, happens. And some of the signs would be verbal aggressiveness, boasting about sexual assaults, 
uh, history of inciting violence among his followers, endorsement of violence in his speeches, attraction to violence and powerful weapons, and taunting of hostile nations with nuclear power. Those are some of the signs. All right, Mandy, tell us um, exactly what is the duty to warn uh, movement and how did this, uh, this book that you've edited come about? So I held a conference in, at Yale about the question of the, the Goldwater Rule, which is the ethical rule that says uh, psychiatrists are not to diagnose public figures without having examined them and gotten consent, and then the duty to warn when there are potential victims involved. And uh, it was an ethical discussion uh, that led to kind of a groundswell of mental health professionals coming forth, but not being able to speak about it because, well, partly because of the Goldwater Rule, but also because many professionals were afraid of being targeted, either litigiously or physically through uh, either litigiously by the president who's famous for going after uh, those who speak out against him and uh, or uh, physical violence by his violence prone followers. Uh, Betty, let me ask you, did what what you, you gave a disclaimer already. What was Yale's position on you holding a conference like this there? And what about your co-workers at the medical school or in the in the uh, other psychiatrists there? What's their opinion of of what you're doing? Yes. So, so in the beginning, um, uh, I mean, it was curious to me because whenever I spoke with my colleagues in private, they shared my concerns. They they also agreed that he was dangerous. But given the controversy surrounding this issue, even though it was just an ethical discussion, not about the specifics of his mental impairment, uh, it just became too risky in terms of politicization. So I I was the one who released them. They still gave me the auditorium space. They still supported me. But but I was just kind of left to do it alone because uh, others were so afraid. I, I love this story about Gary Cohn because it plays right into Trump perfectly. He's over in Asia uh, recently. He calls in about the tax uh, reform bill, and apparently he spoke to 15 minutes uh, you know, on the speakerphone, and it was so incoherent that Gary Cohn finally says, you're brilliant, Mr. President, but we're losing the connection, and they hung up on him. <laughs> and it's a great idea because they played to his ego. All right, Bandy, let's get to an uh, important part of your mission cognitive and intellectual standards and evaluations before someone is running for uh, for president. What do you mean exactly, and, and, and what would you like to see happen? Well, uh, the fact that presidential candidate or president doesn't have to go through a fitness for duty exam is kind of a glaring omission, considering that he's commander-in-chief. The, the fact that we're encountering all these problems and questions is because uh, we don't have that uh, system in place, and it does take a mental health professional to to doubt their capacity and 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 see patterns of impairment rather than strategy. Or um, I, I actually have seen uh, probably over a thousand individuals like Mr. Trump, but they're usually not uh, certainly not in the office of the president and usually not even out in general public. I was going to say, you you say you've seen a thousand. Are they successful people or are these guys that are locked up? Brilliant at manipulating, deceiving, and uh, and tormenting others. Uh, Donald Trump, as Tom was mentioning, he started out with wealth and resources and connections. He didn't have to go there. He could do it. I, I mean, he could even be criminal and not have to be responsible for it. So this um, process that you would like to see candidates go through, they might come out of this and, and somebody, the group might say, no, you, you cannot run for president. Would it, would, it be like, would it be that blunt? Mental impairment is no different than physical impairment. Uh, and it's, it's screen. It doesn't decide who can and cannot run for president. It, it simply uh, says that uh, one has the normal capacity that would be expected of of the job. Okay, we're down to about the last minute and a half. Tell us what you'd like to see happen. I mean, there's this 25th Amendment where he can be, you know, be declared essentially incapacitated. It doesn't seem that that's a very realistic option with his own folks in office. There's impeachment. 
there's other things. What, what do you? What would you like to see happen? Oh, go ahead, Dandy. I think you're much clearer about this than I am. Uh, actually, I, I consider this to be outside of my domain. In court testimonies, for example, when we consult with legal bodies. Uh, even uh, unfitness for duty, disability, uh, these are incapacity. These are mm-hmm. legal decisions, mm-hmm. not uh, mental health decisions. We merely give our recommendations. And in the case of the 25th Amendment, it would be a political decision. Uh, uh, they say it's unlikely because of the odds you would need. Right. Um, uh, so, so we're continuing to sound uh, the warning uh, what lawmakers do with this, what the public does with this, I guess would be a, ultimately a political decision. Thanks to Drs. Bandy Lee and Tom Singer. And their book again, The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump, 27 Psychiatrists and Mental Health Experts Assess a President. This has been Forensic Talk with Jim Campbell, our podcast at WGCH.com. You can go to YouTube and search Forensic Talk with Jim Campbell or Park City Productions 06604, and we'll see everybody again next Monday evening for another edition of Forensic Talk with Jim Campbell.